大家好，我是玛丽亚，我其实会说点中文，但是我现在给你们讲的内容还是有点复杂，所以我用英语给你们讲，对不起。OK， 谢谢。Um, so I'm Maria. I came to China. I moved to China about four years ago. I'm an illustrator, a writer, and also graphic designer. So why did I move to China? So this is the reason why I moved to China. When I was studying art in Hamburg, my hometown, I met my now husband Ma Chenli. He was studying design at the same university. So after graduating, we went to Kiel, another German city. And um, there I studied illustration, and he studied interface design. So uh, while still being in our master, we got married in Denmark. Why Denmark? Because it's like the Las Vegas of Europe. It's super easy to get married there. So um, after graduating, we decided to move to China. Uh, so we didn't really had a plan. Um, we just wanted to see what kind of possibilities might be installed for us. And we also chose to move to Hangzhou, not because we had a plan, but because we think Hangzhou is really beautiful. There are mountains and the lake, so no plan at all. So uh, Chen Li was the first one to get a job as an industrial designer, but I soon realized it's kind of difficult to get a job as a foreigner, as a designer. So I don't want to be an language teacher, so there's no job for me in Hangzhou. So I had a lot of time to stay at home and to contemplate. At that time, I was reading Pu Song Ling, Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio. And in my mind, there was blooming an idea, an idea of a board game which could incorporate all of those weird stories. 2020, in spring 2020, Chen Li and I first decided to um, found our own studio. Then in autumn 2020, we also had our first employee. And this is how our de design studio, Fortuna Design, came into existence. But at the beginning, we didn't really have any clients. So what can we do? the three of us, we made this board game I was dreaming about. So it took us a long time, nearly one year, and we had to change the rules so many times over, and we had a successful crowdfunding, and at the end, we gave birth to our board game baby, Wan Ling Shong Shang. So this is Wan Ling Shong Shang. It's a board game about the wheel of reincarnation, about Samsara. And every player starts as a bodiless soul, and to win, you need to be the first one to reincarnate. You can reincarnate as a human or as a ghost. We use the Chinese word gui, but it's actually a collective term for a lot of different weird creatures, animal spirits, plant spirits, and all the like. So for winning, you need to have at least five human attribute cards, for becoming a human, or five ghost attribute cards for becoming a ghost. In total, this board game has 54 different attribute cards, and this is how we incorporated all of those Chinese, Japanese, and European ghost stories, because all of those 54 attribute cards have their own illustrations uh, and own background stories. This also makes it possible that after winning, you can have a look at what kind of being you did reincarnate. That when you did become a human, you can see what kind of human you did become. Are you good with plants? Do you like eating? Or are you really emotional? And when you did become a ghost, you can see what kind of ghost you did become. Are you hairy, only have one eye, or a long neck? So a lot of people see our board game for the first time and think, is this something like tarot? Is this something to predict the future with? Uh, so we thought, that's cool, that's a nice idea. Let's make a fortune-telling system with our 54 attribute cards. So now all of the attribute cards are connected with one of the four elements, uh, fire, earth, air, and water. As you can see, there are only four elements, so it's a hum European fortune telling system, and then the balance or the dominance of one element can predict your future. We even had an exhibition where we used those Taoist bamboo sticks, and all of our employees can now predict the future, and the girls were standing in line to have a prediction about their future love life.
as I said before, I was inspired by Pu Sung Ling, um, but I think everything which I read from childhood on somehow inspired me. So when I was a child, I was really into European fairy tales. I liked Alice in Wonderland, The Moomins, and Lord of the Rings. And when I got older, I started reading novels of the genre magical realism. And I like those stories because I like how dream and reality and fantasy and magic all mixing with each other. So in 2015, um, I visited China for the first time, and Chen Li gave as a present to me my first ever Chinese novel, which was uh, Journey to the West. So when I read Journey for the West, I was amazed to see that those elements, those elements of dream and reality and magic mixing uh, with each other is also, you can also find this in uh, Chinese literature. But I think because of the belief in reincarnation and past lives, those magical elements are kind of different. So for example, the famous novel um, Hong Long Meng, the uh, unhappy fate of Dayu has already been determined by her past life and by her woe to Bao Yu to repay him in tears. So I want to dig a bit deeper into uh, detailed um, attribute stories, and I hope everyone can see that Wanling Shongsheng is not only a board game about weird creatures, but it is also a board game about um, humans, which can animate us to contemplate what it's like to be a human and what kind of possibilities we have as humans. So this is, for example, the ghost attribute tree spirit. It has been inspired by an episode in Journey to the West. In this episode, Chuan Zhang is meeting a tree which transformed into an old man and who is inviting him to drink tea with him. This episode somehow reminded me of classical European fairy tales where there are also um, trees that can walk and talk and transform into humans. But the difference between European fairy tales and Chinese stories is that those, in those Chinese stories, those animal and plant spirits, they had some Taoist training. They somehow had managed to collect this heaven and earth chi, and this is how they managed to become immortal and to transform uh, into humans. So this was kind of interesting and new for me. So we humans, on the other hand, we didn't really get how to collect this heaven and earth chi. So after being born, we grow up, and then we already grow old, and then we die. Um, so it seems like the only constant in our human existence is to always change. Uh, some people might think this is kind of depressing, but it could be worse. As you can see with the ghost attribute endlessly set, so this ghost attribute was inspired by a typical ghost story. So a typical ghost story is someone got cruelly and unjustly murdered, and then the soul gets stuck, gets stuck at the place of murder and cannot move on. And from then on is wailing her, un, her or his unjust fate, and is also eternally stuck in one emotion. We humans, on the other hand, have many different emotions within, I don't know, one hour. So every period of sadness will ultimately come to its end. For example, this ghost attribute skeleton um, was inspired by European legends. So in Europe, um, the skeleton is a symbol of death, but it's also a symbol of vanitas. Vanitas means the emptiness and meaningless of life. So the skeleton wants to remind us that all of us will soon look like it and that we shouldn't waste our time with idle thoughts about youth and beauty. So this vanitas concept comes from a Christian Jewish tradition which sees everything earthly as vain and empty. For example, our own human body would also be considered as something vain and empty, since it will ultimately wither away. And it's no wonder that so many humans have a conflicting relationship with their own body. A lot of people think their body is too big or too small or too old or too this or too that. So, but I sometimes, when I read the stories of the tree spirit, that 
learned so, so much time and made such a force to collect this heaven and earth to, to finally have this human body, I wonder why we humans are still not content. So this um, attribute, fake heart, was inspired by uh, Pu Song Ling's painted skin. When I read this story for the first time, I somehow felt sorry for this ghost who ripped out the heart of the name, uh, man named Wang, because I somehow felt the ghost only wanted to be loved by Wang. And in the end, uh, Wang only survived because of his wife, who pro poured a new heart into his body, uh, which was produced by this magical spit of the crazy Taoist. So uh, I personally think the most heartless character in this story might not be the ghost, but maybe Wang. And if I had been the wife, I wouldn't have made the fuss to revive this unfaithful husband. So we humans have possibilities to move in this or that direction. As you can see, this is now a ghost attribute, but it might also be a human attribute. So a lot of people are interested to know why I, a German, am painting in a way which seems to be heavily influenced by Chinese art, but also seems to be a kind of weird. Um, so I guess the easiest way to show you, to tell you this, is by showing you um, pictures which I consume, which means look at the most which are pictures from the Tang period, Korean paintings, Nianhua, uh, Arabic book illustrations, Persian and Indian miniatures, and European medieval uh, book illustrations. I like all of those paintings because they depict legends, the magical, the mystical, astrology. I feel like they are not so much concerned um, with the style because they have a story to tell. The story comes first and then comes the painting, which is not to underestimate uh, the status of the painting, but I think the meaning of the painting has already been determined uh, by the story. So to show you a bit more in detail this Asian-European mix, which is going on in my mind while I'm painting, here are um, I show you another two of the attribute cards. So for example, this is the attribute magical powers. Uh, when I read the story of Zhongkui, I somehow thought he's a magician. So I don't know why, but I guess when your job is demon bashing, uh, you somehow need to have some magical powers. But when you're a magician, you also need to wear clothes with stars on it, because this is what European magicians are wearing. So this is now the ghost attribute, magical powers, embodied by Zhongkui, the Chinese magician. This is another ghost attribute, life force. So uh, we humans need to drink and to eat. So I thought about an equivalent for the ghost world. What are ghosts feeding on? So I guess they're feeding on humans, but not necessarily um, for the calories or the nutrients, but because they want to have our life force. So how to depict this? So I thought about something like a alchemistical sun elixir, life force in a bottle. And in my mind, in the underworld, there are some bars where ghosts can buy this in a bottle and drink it with a straw. So I want to show you another one of my projects um, where you can see weird creatures telling us something about our human nature. So this book is called Gudu in Gwai. It has been published in Poland last year, and it will be translated into French this year. So Gudu and Gwai are two creatures that live behind high mountains and deep inside a forest, and they live in a giant snail shell house. So those two are Gudu and Gwai. Gwai thinks finds himself strange. He thinks his nose is too long, his ears are too flabby, his fur is too striped. So actually, everything which characterizes him, he doesn't like. So this is the reason why he never leaves the house. And the other is Gudu. Gudu feels lonely because he thinks that no one understands him. And he thinks that his thoughts are really complicated. And he actually never talked to anybody, but he's also sure he wouldn't be able to. So this is the reason why he never leaves the house. This is a typical day in Gwai's lives. It starts with a desperate attempt to become someone else. 
So Guai has a lot of costumes and masks and makeup and a paper bag, but ne nothing is ever good enough. He's never satisfied. And this is how Gudu imagines a conversation to be like. Gudu and Guai also don't know each other because Gudu lives in the deepest death of the snail shell and Guai never has been there. But one day, Guai hears a wailing and sobbing from the death and he descends the stairs and this is how he finds Gudu crying in a dark corner. So it's of course a happy end. Guai will help Gudu to finally be able to talk to others and Gudu will help Guai to get rid of his masks. And at the end, they will together leave their snail shell and realize that outside everyone seems to be a bit weird, seems to be a bit strange, different than others, but that this is no reason to become lonely. So as you can see, uh, the book is also influenced by Chinese art, but this time also by Chinese language, uh, as you can see with the names Guru and Guai. But Gudu and Guai actually sounds really cute in German. It really sounds like two children book characters. And on the other hand, the, for example, the snail shell house comes from a German saying, you have to get out of your snail shell. And this would be directed to someone shy and introvert. So it's actually a children's book, but a lot of reactions come from adults who say, oh, I'm just like Gudu or I'm just like Guai. And I, of course, can understand this. I think I'm both of them. I'm Gudu and Guai at the same time, but I think I'm a bit more like Gudu. So to stand here and share my thoughts um, is kind of my own personal nightmare. But I'm also not so sure if you underst understand me, but I can just hope it. So, but enough of all those weird creatures. Let's move, to my s move on to my second favorite topic, which is love. So what is love? I'm asking this question um, with the book on the other side. So on the other side is a conversation between Guan Yin and Plato. And they're talking about an immortal being which is called Androgynoi. Androgynoi is not only immortal, but it has a, another special feature. By day it's a man and every night it transforms into a woman. So uh, Androgynoi is moving through different times. The story starts in ancient Greece, uh, then goes, moves on to medieval Europe, and it ends in China under the rule of the Qing. So Androgynoi, despite always being the same, it soon realizes that humans, that every time and every culture has its own concept and own beliefs about what a woman or what a man should be like, and that those concepts divide men and women from each other. So I used famous European paintings to depict those expectations which have been historically placed on men and women. So for example, this is how men should be like. Men should be mighty, should be in power, should be ready to fight. And this is how women should be like. Women should be beautiful, women should be mothers, or at best, beautiful mothers. So this the book is mainly drawn in um, plain pencil drawings, but for every time and culture, there's also given an idea about what love could be, and those paintings are all in color. So the base for this book is the Symposium. The Symposium is a text by Plato, and it is written in a dialogue form, and a group of men meeting in the evening for supper, and they decided not to get drunk again like the evening before, but to use the time to philosophize about the nature um, of love. So every one of them will share their views, but I want to share with you the views of Aristophanes, because this is where I had the, the, the idea for the name Androgynoi from. So Aristophanes shares uh, the legend of the spherical humans, we humans once have been. So we humans, once upon a time, did not have what, one head, but two heads. And we did not just have uh, two arms and legs, but each four of them. And there have been three different 
uh, types of those spherical humans. One originated from the sun and was made of two men. The second originated from the earth and was made of two women. And the third originated from the moon and was made of a man and a woman. And this one was called androgynoi. Andro meaning man and gynoi meaning woman. So a man, woman, spherical human. And those humans have been so mighty and so powerful that uh, they decided to fight against the gods. So while they were storming the Olymp, the gods were discussing what to do with us. It would have been easy for them to just kill us, but then there would have been no one left to take care of the holy temple fires. So Zeus decided not to kill us, but to weaken us. So he took a string and pulled it tight between his hands, and with the string, he cut all of the spherical humans into halves, one by one, just like cooked eggs. And in the end, the god Apollo was to cure our wounds, and only one scar was left, our be belly button, to remind us of, the, of our rebellion against the gods. Um, so this is now the reason why we humans are all desperately searching for our second lost half. Um, maybe someone now has hard feelings against the gods, but I can tell you that Zeus even considered to cut us another time into halves if we ever consider rebellion again, and then we would be only like snakes crawling on the ground, and we would have to find three lost parts of ourselves. So this wouldn't even be romantic anymore. So um, yeah, this is a book on the other side. This book is asking the question how it is to be someone else, what it's like to be someone else. So I'm a woman, and I'm interested to know what it's like to be a man. And I hope there might also be some men that are interested to know what it's like to be a woman. So what it's like to be none of both, what it's like to be on the other side. So this is the reason why I chose Guan Yin to talk with Platon, because uh, Guan Yin is not only a she, but also a he, and I guess definitely knows what it's like to be on the other side. So let's stay at the topic of love. This is uh, the dark side of the moon. It's a love letter. And in this love letter, we are telling the story of Chang'e and Hou Yi, which is one of China's oldest love stories. But uh, it has a, many different versions. Um, but I guess, at least for our modern standards, those versions cannot really be considered love stories, um, because in many versions, Chang'e is depicted as selfish and greedy, wanting to have the immortality pill for her for herself, and in some versions, Hou Yi is even trying to shoot her, but she's flying off to the moon. So we rewrote the story, that it actually can be told as a love story. So in our version, Hou Yi is shooting down the nine suns, which are threatening to burn the earth, and only one sun, the nine sun, can escape to the dark side of the moon. And Chang'e is not taking the immortality pill out of greed, but because she needs to fight the Nine Sun, which is returning to Earth uh, to revenge Ho Yi. And when Ho Yi wakes up in the morning and sees that the immortality pill and Chang'e are gone, he first thinks that she preferred immortality over him. But then in a dream, he sees that she is residing on the moon and is guarding uh, the Nine Suns. And from then on, every day, he prepares her favorite dishes and puts them in the moonlight in, ev in the evening as an offering to her. And touched by his love, Xi Wang Mu then gives Hou Yi another immortality pill, and this is how Hou Yi becomes the, uh, the saint residing on the sun. This story of Chang'e and Hou Yi is a sun-moon love story. So it doesn't matter in which culture you are searching, from Africa to Europe to the Americas to Asia, in every culture, there is a love story about the sun and the moon. So I think we humans like to hear stories about opposites falling in love. And if you can still remember the story which I told you before, the story about the spherical humans and the story about androgynoi, I think there might be some connections. So for this story, we didn't choose a, 
a book format, but an old folding method, which is called puzzle purse. And this folding method originated in Japan, uh, but it made its way to Europe in the 18th century, and the Europeans saw it as a perfect format for writing love letters on. Because when you uh, want to reveal your love to someone, you don't want it to be bold and sudden, but you want that your feelings reveal bit by bit and your heart to be unfolded bit by bit, and this letter also unfolds bit by bit and reveals its content bit by bit. So you can even put little presents into this love letter, and something like dried flowers or jewelry, or when you're like old Europeans, you can even put a strand of your own hair inside, which might be creepy. But uh, uh, on the back side, you can even uh, write your own personal message. So we hope that all of those old stories and all of those old souls don't vanish and that we won't stop telling those stories to each other. And we hope that we all, all of us, can use our human attribute, our human ability of imagination a bit more. Because imagination is the, this ability that while you lie on your bed and you do nothing, you don't move one finger, you can still fly to the outskirts of the universe. You can visit Chang'e on the moon, or you can drink tree, a tea with tree spirits. And imagination is just this ability which lets you leave this world for a while, and when you come back to it, you will have a new idea or a new dream. Thank you.